Are you ready? Stand by. Welcome to the Three Gun Show, brought to you by Armalite. I'm your host, Dave Hartman, and my guest this week is Three Gunner and Rock Hard Match Director, Bruce Davidson. Bruce, how are you? I'm very good, Dave. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's good to have you, Bruce. I'm, uh, I'm excited to get into our topic here, but before we do that, if you like this uh, this type of podcast, subscribe in iTunes and uh, make sure that you are a Patreon supporter as well. Uh, Patreon supporters get access to special match recon podcasts, a uh, private Facebook group, various other uh, levels of engagement and rewards. Check that out at patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P T P A T R E O N. And be sure to listen after this, the podcast for a special offer from Armalite and enjoy this one with Bruce Davidson. Bruce, where, where are we uh, finding you today? I am hanging out in my barn in Shelbyville, Kentucky, just outside of Louisville. Nice. Now, your uh, your barn, uh, drafty tobacco hanging from the rafters, some mules running around. Well, it's not that kind of barn as most of them are in Kentucky. But from where <laughs> I sit, I can, I can see my donkeys. I do have two donkeys out running in the yard. But uh, this is a brand new barn, still building, fully insulated, fully finished, and bathrooms and pool tables and gaming stuff and refrigerators and beer so you know my my buddies call it a man cave which i think is kind of a old tired term but yeah here we are in the man cave nice <laughs> i like calling it the barn it sounds uh agricultural and people think you uh you might actually be out there working and everything yeah sometimes i work but yeah i, I don't mind sounding like a hick i kind of am so yeah barn <laughs> works good and I got a nice fire going today, so I think it's up to about 65 degrees, and it's uh, quite pleasant in here. Excellent. Well, it's uh, so I'm in uh, Lakewood, Colorado. It's about 21 degrees outside right now. And uh, the Three Gun Show studio has these three giant windows um, that are facing the south, and uh, which is good because we get sunlight, right? But there's no sun today. It's all cloudy. <laughs> and so I was all pumped because I, I, you know, I'm like, oh, man, I got this view, and I spent like, you know, eight nine years in in aerospace with these buildings that were built in the cold war and they had no windows whatsoever so it was always drab and you know cinder blocks everywhere so i was like pumped i get these windows and it is freaking freezing in here oh because of the window yeah yeah. it's the price you pay i know i know so i i need to get like a wood stove or something like that then you gotta go start chopping wood and um man that's a vicious circle (laughs) yeah you know, I have this giant pile of wood behind the bar, and, and I love to gaze upon it. And it it hurts a little bit every time I bring in another load and and stack it by the fireplace. I'm thinking, damn, I need to get out there and split some more wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a never ending process, just kind of chasing your uh, your tail on splitting wood. Right. Well, Bruce, we're uh, we're here to talk to talk about uh, a match that you run at the Rock Castle Shooting Center. Uh, called Rock Hard and uh, and its inspiration and where it came from and stuff. But before we get into that, let's take it back um, to your start in uh, in competitive shooting and uh, and let's talk about how you got into shooting. But first, tell us what you do when you're not on the range. What's what's uh, what's Bruce's life look like uh, away from uh, Rock Castle? Ooh, not on the range is tough. I run a retail business. Uh, it's a pet store. Uh, that's in, in Louisville. I actually took that over from my mom. So I've been working for her for 27 years. Um, she's on her way out, and I don't know anything about the business. Of course, that's her opinion. Uh, but anyway, so that's, <laughs> that's the day-to-day. It's a 3,000-square-foot it's a uh, building. I keep 13 employees. So, you know, the, the big thing is managing people at that point. It's not a small business anymore. you you got people that are trying to work for you. So uh, that's tough. I, although after after as many years as I've been there, um, having good management is really where it's at. So that's why I'm off on a Thursday afternoon hanging out in my barn because I've got two managers that are out there making me money. Very cool. Yeah, so the, the pet store is fun. You know, it's it's mostly aquatics. I, I really spent the the majority of my career doing aquariums and doing custom aquariums and 
that was always a lot of fun designing great big systems. I got to install the world's largest jellyfish tank for a restaurant. And if you're in the area, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, West Virginia, if you've ever eaten at a Cheddar's restaurant, I put that aquarium in there. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, I decided life is a lot easier if I just pay myself more and then quit, quit going out and humping to try to sell big aquariums to people. A lot less hassles that way. So not too many custom aquarium jobs anymore unless they're very lucrative. Right, right. Yeah, so you kind of do like the, uh, uh, the premium end of it then, so you don't roll out of bed for just a normal installation? Yeah, to get me to work outside of work, it's, it's going to be a whale. <laughs> or, you know, something that's really, really exciting to me. Um, but, but honestly, that's hard. I mean, you know, the money is really good, but it's hard work. And, and the thing I think that gets me out of that most is that at some point, your time belongs to someone else. Yeah. You know, when you sell somebody a, a million dollar aquarium, they kind of expect you to, to keep tabs on it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, after being in the retail business and giving up all the personal life for so long, that's very valuable to me. So I'm very cautious to give anyone control of a Saturday or a Tuesday night or, or anything. Yeah, you kind of become their, their like, uh, consultant then from there on out, right? It's not just like a handover, well, see you later, good luck with your big-ass aquarium. Yeah, right, and then it's it's tough to bill. You know, you make good money, but then, you know, if you're just talking to them on the phone or you know, they expect you, Hey, swing by on your way home from work. You know, it's no big deal. So yeah, yeah, there's a lot of time there that there's just no billing for anymore. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like that with, uh, with a lot of specialty things. And, uh, I've heard that from some gunsmith friends, right? You end up being like tech support all the time. You like you own the shotgun rather than the uh, customer does. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. But you know, I mean, I touched on some bad things. Life is pretty good. I am my own boss. Sure. So, uh, you know, as as we become more successful than our time, um, we get a lot more of our, our time. We can take days off and do whatever we want to do. Although next Saturday I am missing a local three gun match because all of my keyed employees, I've got three people with keys, they're all going out of town. So I'll be working slinging fish while my buddies are shooting three gun. <laughs> slinging fish. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the uh, – you know, you got the, the pet store, um, aquarium type, type stuff. You have your hand in like a lot of other hobbies as well. Like I, I, you know, we've been, uh, been friends for about a year right now and we've had, uh, quite a long conversation when we did the industry choice awards together as well. And, uh, you've got some other interesting hobbies and, uh, and interests as well. Yeah. I like to call it toy airplanes. Um, so I've been flying remote control sailplanes since I was a, a little kid, about 13 years old, I guess. Um, but for the past 30 years, I got serious about that and, and started competing. Uh, and believe it or not, that's a world class event. So, you know, there's a world championship every other year, at different disciplines. And um, so that, that started out really good for me. I, you know, it was great. My wife was into it. We traveled to competitions just about every weekend. Uh, ended up as a sponsored pilot for a bunch of different companies through the years. Um, competed, uh, you know, at the national championship level. I, I was able to win the nationals a couple of times. Competed at the world championship level. So I got to wear the USA colors and represent the country while I was out in other countries. Wow. Um, yeah, fantastic. So that's kind of waning. Um, you know, as Christine is my wife, She so she was very tolerant. She's a she really would rather hang around with a bunch of dudes than a bunch of girls. So it was always a good time for her to go to the competitions and, and hang out, but she never participated. You know, she was, she didn't complain. She certainly looked forward to it, but she never participated. And then we picked up guns. So, it, so it's kind of funny. So the, the backstory of the guns where that starts, well, let's not even go to that one yet. Right. We're still talking about toy airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, because we haven't we haven't even got to the uh, the super interesting part of this yet, right? Um, so I decided one of my sponsors he was an airplane manufacturer, um, so I I was his talent. I flew his airplanes for him and competed, and uh, one of my national championships was one flying one of his models. Well, he was a, a mentor in how to put on a contest. 
So this guy was up in Pennsylvania. And so typically when you have an airplane contest, they're a lot like a shooting competition, right? It's a primitive site. And by that, I mean, there's no electricity. It's just like, here's your field. Mm -hmm. So you guys can park your cars here and we're going to go fly over there. And that's it. So you go for a two day, uh, three day competition and all you've got are your buddies and what you brought in. Well, my, um, at this point, Denny, my mentor in this whole deal, so he does one up in Pennsylvania, and he called it an event. So it was a, a hand-launch glider event, and he engaged people um, for the whole weekend. He had other events. He had a big pavilion, and he actually did a pig roast. So the pig roast is going on the first day. Everybody smells it. He had games, and, and he really brought everyone together for you know to fly the competition, but more importantly – to do a bunch of other organized things together and to fill the time. And very quickly, it turned into the biggest competition in the United States. Everybody would go there every year. It was fantastic. Well, um, he got older, decided to get out of doing that. This was nine years ago. So he, he has his last event and he's done. And I decided, well, um, years before that, uh, it was so into flying model airplanes that I went out and bought acreage i bought 21 acres so i could secure my own flying site for the rest of my life oh wow um you know they're like flying sites are like shooting ranges so yeah. they they pop up and then for some reason political or, or whatever it is they disappear do check this um, out we've got a, a remote control plane place or i don't know what you call it, landing strip airport uh -huh. something like that uh we'll say it again rc field yes we have one of those in uh just outside of Golden and uh, in Golden, Colorado, and it used to be a shooting range. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> right, so the, the airplanes ate the shooting range. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, now they're probably complaining about the uh, the buzzing of the airplanes. Sure, it, it, and they definitely will. That's the, the problem with them. They always go away. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, I bought this acreage, and um, Christine and I built a house on it. And decided, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to take over this competition. And it was funny, you know, I kick, kick the idea around with my friends and they're all, you know, they, of course they want a big competition. So they're all giving me the green light and the thumbs up. And I said, well, you know, what do we call it? And one of my buds says, call it the Bruce. And it's stuck. <laughs> so the, the Bruce has been going on for nine years. Um, I host that and, and I call it a sailplane event. So just like my mentor did. And I do the same thing. Whereas, of course, it's at my house. So I have 100 people at my house for four days every September. Nice. And, you know, that was part of the motivation of building the barn is in the barn, I have a full bath and another shower with a flow through hot water heater. So these guys camp. I encourage everyone to camp. I've got the room. So about three quarters of the people actually camp on site. Uh, they can utilize my showers anytime they want. And, you know, the reason for them to camp is because I have kegs of beer. <laughs> so you know i've been doing that and since the the very first year and all the way till this past september it's the biggest sailplane competition in the united states and it's a it's a really big party and uh you know i learned a lot i learned a lot from um my mentor denny and then doing it here for nine years it really taught me a lot about running events and you know engaging people for things yeah that's pretty cool you know one one of the uh the things that I've noticed, I've, I've seen you um, speak a couple times at some matches at, at Rock Castle, and it's not the uh, the usual, um, you know, guy standing on a tailgate. Hey, guys, well, well, I want to welcome you to the uh, match here. And, uh, you know, that that sort of thing. You you speak very animated, and you do engage people as uh, as as listeners as well, and you don't, you don't tolerate people, uh, you know, side conversations and stuff like that. You know, that's right. Actually, I do that at my airplane competition, too. When I speak, there's no other speaking. Nobody else gets to talk. It's important. Um, I'm not going to gather everybody together and waste their time. Right. So I have important things to say, whether it's a schedule for the day, rules, do's and don'ts, whatever it is. I really need everyone to be engaged in that. So, you know, I get that. I do that with my employees, too. That comes from managing people is um, you just some things you can't tolerate. And I'm really big on evolution, right? So you can't let a small thing go because it evolves into a big thing. And at some point you're saying, how did we get here? 
So it's all about that evolution. At the, at the very beginning, and I'm going to do it at the rock hard at the shooters meeting, somebody is going to get called out. But you only got to do that to one person. And then they pay attention, then we have fun, and that expedites things too, right? So you pay attention, I say what I need to get th- to say, and then we're done. We move on and we get to what we came for, shooting mm-hmm. or flying. Yeah, it, it, you know, it like sets the, uh, the tone for the event as well. Yeah. It does. I like that. So now these, uh, these planes you're flying, um, some of them are like pretty sophisticated, right? The, yeah. You know, if you, if you don't know what we're talking about, it's, you know, they're a glider, which means, so we don't have any power plant. There's no motor, there's no engine, there's no anything, but we have control surfaces. As it turns out, um, sailplanes, the, the inside joke is when someone says, oh, I fly RC air, airplanes, and they're talking about what we call slimers, gassed airplanes, and they ask, you know, you ever fly any, any powered ones? And we say, no, I like to think when I fly. <laughs> um, so because, every, you know, it's all an exercise in efficiency, ultimately. You have to be really intimate with how an airplane behaves, and then you have to pay just critical attention to the efficiency of the air, airframe. It's a, it's a game of how long you can keep it in the air. And in order to do that, you got to fly in the right spot. So you got to be able to read the weather. Mm -hmm. Um, You got to be able to read the wind. And um, it's, it gets us just past the basics of aviation and takes us into a whole different management program. The cool thing is, is all the aero engineers worldwide, um, that's where they gravitate to. So, you know, they're, they're an aero engineer in the real world. Well, if they start flying toy airplanes, once you, once you get the basics, like I can do whatever needs to be done with an airplane, once you accomplish that, there's no place to go with a powered one. But with a sailplane, it's always about getting that other, that next bit of efficiency. So, you know, we've got skunk work engineers and just crazy engineers that gravitate towards this. The director of aeronautics at MIT designs these toy airplanes because it's all about efficiency. He actually has a curriculum, so he has his students optimizing toy airplanes. So it's really cool that the sailplanes are the highest engineered model airplanes in the model airplane world. What's even better is those engineers come to competitions and then a dipshit like me can beat them. (laughs) (laughs) A a fish slinger from Louisville. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I get great satisfaction out of, you know, beating doctors, aeronautical doctors. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. So, yeah, but, you know, that was kind of the appeal. Um, you know, first off is that when Christine started shooting guns, she was actually engaged. Um, we shot our first competition. Uh, and after that competition, she dreamed about shooting, dreamed about shooting competitions. Really? She never dreamed about toy airplanes. So it was like the second time that she tells me that she had a dream that we were shooting a match somewhere when I decided airplanes are the secondary hobby, right? That one's gone away. And now the hobby is, is shooting because uh, Christine likes to shoot. She loves shooting long guns. She's not interested in carrying them around on the clock. So she's not going to do a three gun match, but uh, we shoot USPSA together. That's where we got our start. And we still shoot several USPSA matches together every year. Mm -hmm. How how long have you guys uh, been shooting together? (laughs) <laughs> you know, I had to look cause I knew you were going to ask me this question. <laughs> so we bought, it, it, there's a funny story behind this one as well. Um, so my wife is Puerto Rican from Brooklyn. Okay. Okay. We grew up in Brooklyn. Um, so we're married. This is 2011. I don't, I'm not going to try to do that math. Anyway, new year's day, 2011. There's a gun show in Louisville as there is every new year's day in Louisville. At the, at the convention center, big gun show. So it's like, hey, let's go to the gun show. Let's buy a gun. Well, the whole way there, so she's, of course, never touched a gun. The only, in, the only thing she knows about gun is what she learned off the TV. So driving to the gun show, she's really worried that we can even buy a gun because we don't have a license to have a gun. And we haven't, you know, there's no certification. And I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. Yeah, we'll go. So anyway, we go to the gun show. Um, New Year's Day, 2011, and bought a um, two Rugers. Got a, a Ruger Mark III pistol and the 22 rifle. Nice. So that's it. Good we come start. Home. I actually have a – back in 2011, a lot of cameras actually put the date on the picture, which was very helpful because <laughs> I found a picture of her shooting that pistol off the deck 
on January 2nd, 2011. And that's where it started. Nice. Yeah. So she loved it. And, you know, then. So you just started plinking off the back deck. Started plinking off the deck. Yeah. Across the, the acreage, the airplane field. So, and you know, at that point it was just having a couple of guns, plinking around with 22s back in the day when 22 was almost free. Um, so we shot that a bunch and you know, then it's that really vicious evolution, right? You get your first gun and all you can think about is another gun and you go to every gun store and you're looking at the gun, <laughs> and you're reading the magazines and you turn into this total gun geek, right? And she's right there. She's right there with it. So some of the local, um, shooting indoor ranges, you know, they got guns that you can rent, you can pick up and shoot. So we shoot different ones and pick up guns here and there. Well, in that, that passion, you know, I'm in the pet store working. And of course, you know, it, you end up with a gun conversation with customers. And there's this old guy that, um, you know, talks about guns every time he comes in. And, and he always says, man, you need to go shoot a match. You need to go shoot a USPSA match. You know, he's every time he's telling me this. Here, check out this website. Look at this. So, you know, I look at the website and tell Christine, ah, let's go shoot a match. You know, John's going to take us to a match. So um, it was sometime in 2011. You know, it, it, the evolution oh, it pretty happened quick. pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. Got into it. I, you know, I'm that way. I've been in competition since I was a, a really small kid. Always doing some sort of, of competitive activity, organized competitive activity. So, I, you know, I have that personality. Christine doesn't. She's not competitive at all, but she likes to have a good time. So anyway, we go first time. Um, she doesn't shoot. She goes to watch. Shoot the match. So the, the old guy hangs with a bunch of old guys. They actually have their own squad at, at um, the two local ranges that have USPSA matches. Mm-hmm. And it's all their buddies. They get together, and they all shoot single stack. So it's like, single stack? What's that about? 1911? Yeah, that's cool. So then I got to go buy a couple 1911s. Oh, just a good reason to go buy a couple of guns, right? It is, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, by the second time Christine shoots a match, we're both – I'm pretty sure I was shooting the 1911, but my first match is I look back on my USPSA history and, um, we shot limited. So, which, which makes sense. You know, everybody gets started. It doesn't matter what you brought with you. Just shoot limited because you can fill your magazines up. Right. So, you know, we get to shooting a bunch of matches and like I said, Christine's dreaming about it and, uh, ends up twisting my arm into her getting a 2011. Oh. You know, yeah. Well, you know, so the, the secret is, and I'm sure she'll listen to the podcast and some. well, she's heard the story anyway. So, you know, she wants it in nine mil because, you know, she shoots nine millimeters, an easier gun for ladies. And she wants this. Mike Foley's involved in this. He, he it was, he's quite, <laughs> was quite the trickster and uh, really, really twisted my arm into to getting this 2011. The justification was, that's a great gun for three guns. Right, a nine yeah. millimeter STI 2011. Right. So anyway, end up getting the gun for her that day. She still shoots it. It's a great gun for her. I used it in three gun for a while, um, and then you know, switched to a polymer gun, which I really like my Glocks. So about actually the the second year that we were shooting USPSA, both of us, Christine and I, went to the range officer class, the two day class, and got certified as range officers. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, it's funny because three gunners will always talk about that guy that brings up USPSA shit at a match. Yeah. <laughs> but as, um, so, you know, being an RO now, of course I'm involved in every single match that I shoot, which at, at USPSA, it's great. They're all like-minded individual. And it's funny cause I listen to your show all the time and you can tell the people that came up in USPSA and the people that came up in three gun because the people that came up in three gun, they've always got jokes about the USPSA guys. But I got to tell you that I appreciate that super thick rule book. Um, I like what they do. It's very specific what they do. And if you have an opportunity to attend the range officer class, the two day class, mm-hmm. that's really the way to go. If I have an option as a match director, if guys want to want to be an RO for me. If one guy's a, a USPSA certified and the other guy's just a real expense, experienced guy, I'm probably going to pick the USPSA guy if all things are equal. Hmm. Okay. Uh, it's a great foundation in what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Um, you know, they've been at it for so long. That's why the rule book is so thick because everything's been addressed. Yeah. 
Um, so anyway, we're both range officers at this point. She is passively participating as an RO, more of a, you know, running the clock while the actual RO is shooting. Um, but you know, I'm since that day, every time I shoot, I'm running a squad. Right. Um, and I like, like I said, I like that background. I like, uh, USPSA and it's been a great ride. It was funny when I looked back to see the history when I first shot, my participation in USPSA matches has gone down every single year. It's fewer and fewer matches. Um, and I miss it. I, I do like that. I, I, um, last year, early last year, I got a card in the mail that said I made a class in limited, which was a total shocker. <laughs> um, it, it was, I mean, that's it, you know, at this point I just enjoy shooting and I'm, you know, I'm doing well, I'm not really tracking my classifiers and certainly not training form. So, uh, that was a real ple- pleasant surprise to get that. The downside is then now that makes me a B class and everything else that I shoot. <laughs> We, we have uh, every year the Bluegrass Sportsman League runs Battle of the Bluegrass. It's a major pistol match, and it's only single stock in production. So, and why is that? Know, I have to make a decision every time. Is it going to be production or single stock? And now I'm a B class, and those guys just beat the crap out of me. <laughs> yeah, you know what? USPSA is, uh, is a lot of fun. The, the, uh, like you said, the rule set is very well defined. Uh, a guest on the show recently said that uh, everyone's been cheating at that game for so long that they've created a rule for everything. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, I, I, I as well just recently was looking at my classification in USPSA because I, I was going to go. Um, I decided I was inspired by my friends in the north who uh, are you know hiding from the winter right now and shooting a bunch of indoor matches during the week, and I, I thought you know. I've only ever shot like one indoor match, never on a regular basis. So I think I'm going to make that a part of my off season. And so I had to go dig up my USPSA number and then, uh, and then re up on, on USPSA and, and man, it's, it's been a long time since I've actually shot a USPSA match. The, uh, um, God, but it's, it's amazing to go back and look at that history and think like, Oh, I remember that match. I remember that. And you know, then there's like the weekend matches. There's the majors you went to. It's all in there. What's your classification? You, I don't know what that means. I think it's unbelievably awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Unbelievably awesome. Yeah. That's what that means. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, it was, it's, it was really fun. I chased B class really hard. I I worked hard to get B. You Mm -hmm. know, I was doing the drills and, and doing all the, really it comes down to mag changes and gun manipulation, right? I mean, that's what classifiers are. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're good skills. You know, you just, you can shoot really fast with a lot of misses to make B as you get past that. Now the, the speeds are given. Now accuracy comes in. I like the way that they have hit factor scoring, you know, and, and there's your outsiders talk <laughs> hit factor. What kind of junk is that? <laughs> but you know, when you're, when you're in it and you're chasing it and you're looking at those classifications, hit factor is a really cool way to score some stuff because it does put an equal emphasis on speed and accuracy. Yeah. You know, you can go real fast and miss, but you know, in, in the lower classes, it's fun because I could go real fast and miss and I could beat my buddies, you know, I, when we got into shooting, so I've got a local buddy, Tom Young. So he and I did everything together, still do always shoot. And he would get really irritated because he would go in, you know, getting his hits and I'm going as fast as I can go and I'm beating him and missing. And he's just like all wound up. That's not cool. (laughs) But you know, it comes together, you know, in the beginning going fast is a reward you. But, uh, as you, as you get to the middle ranks and the upper ranks, going fast is a given. Everybody can go just as fast, right? At that level, right. you're not going to see the guy by very much. So speed at that point is not important anymore. It's given that everybody is, is fast, fast, but now it's accuracy. Yeah. So it, it's a great foundation for pistol. You know, I've, I've, I've felt at times when, when I was practicing and shooting it, pistol was absolutely my strongest gun. You know, I don't do it as much anymore. So pistol is still strong, but I'd have a, I'd be challenged to go out and shoot a couple of A-class classifiers. Mm-hmm. Well, pistol is one of those uh, things that you can you can never shoot enough of it. You know, it's a skill that wanes so fast, 
And uh, it's a skill that really uh, helps you shine even when you're shooting a three gun and just squirting bullets at, you know, giant pizza boxes, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, when when you're shooting a bunch of USPSA and then you go to a, a three gun match and it's like two hits anywhere, you're thinking, holy crap, I can turn this up to 11. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Way, it's like, who cares where I hit the target? It's brown. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's fun. So I, I shot um, production division, and uh, I was kind of uh, I was guided there, by, you know, because I only had a nine millimeter Glock. So I was guided there by a, an early mentor of mine, and I think he recognized that uh, I, I had terrible accuracy, so I needed to slow down and and only have ten tries at a target. So um, <laughs> that was your governor. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But I I had trouble uh, turning it up when I got to three gun matches after that. You know, like the, uh, that gear stuck, you know? Yeah. 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 I've been there too. It's, it's funny. You have to, you have to switch gears, right? Yeah. Okay. This is not USPSA. It's three gun. You need to be conscious of that as you shoot, go out on that first stage, conscious of that. Um, yeah, I've been in that spot a bunch of times too, or, or you shoot a stage and you think, why was I hitting A's? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How did I care so much about those <laughs> targets to hit A zones? Yeah, when they can uh, when they can cover your hits with uh, one piece of tape, you're going too slow. Right, exactly right. And you know the same thing in reverse. So I've I've done that as you shoot a bunch of three gun and then you get into a USPSA match and that first stage is the awakening. Oh yeah, right. You shoot that first stage and it's like, holy shit, I was going way too fast for that. Look <laughs> at all those deltas. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've uh, I've done that. Gone to like a local USPSA match, and you know there they parade you around with uh, you know with the scorekeeper, and you look at all your hits and everything. And I remember thinking on that first stage, oh right, that's right, we're scoring here. <laughs> yeah, right. My bad. These brown things. Well, so briefly, you got you got into uh, you got into competition shooting, and as with. Uh, with anything in your life, the uh, the competitive spirit kind of took over, and you you jumped in full full force. So when did it turn into uh, um, match directing or event planning? And uh, and then how did how did you become uh, the guy that's in charge of the rock hard? So, you know, I live uh, talk about that. I'm I'm in Shelbyville, Kentucky. Well, that's about an hour and forty five away from Rock Castle Shooting Center. Mm-hmm. If you guys have not been to Rock Castle, then go. That's all I can say. Pick a match and, and go. It's, yeah. is absolutely a gem in this shooting industry. So I'm fortunate that I live really, really close. Well, um, so Brian Ray, Brian Vaught, they live a little bit closer than I do. It's their home range. They they ran the local three gun matches. They ran the what they called the die hard match. Mm-hmm. So they, they did the die hard for two years. Might have been three. I'm sure Brian will correct me. You can have him on just to cor- make corrections for my podcast. Yeah. Um, so anyway, they, he, they he sends me correctional text messages all the time. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> I was bought. Um, so, you know, they run the, the diehard match as a one was a one day match and it was, it was hard. This was before I had, had shot um, any of the hard matches. Hard as hell is really the only other one in Utah that I've shot. So, so they have a hard match. It's a one day, and it's a local match because it was in the it was in March, um, short days. Being that it's a one day, or they they could only have like thirty or forty people to have big long hard stages. So it was pretty much a private match. Um, anyway, they they run it for a couple of years. Wonderful success. The the second or third year they do it. The problems, the the complaints that the Bryans have is that all the shooters are, there's a whole lot of pissed off shooters out there that can't come into the match, right? Word gets out, videos get, get out. We're, we're running up hills in the snow and pulling sleds with a bunch of junk in them and, um, just doing crazy hard things. That was appealing to me, which is funny because I'm older now. I'm 51. So at that time I'm, I'm in my late forties. I'm not a, I'm not a go work out, stay fit kind of guy. I mean, I do a lot of things that keep me fit. I'm certainly not a fat bastard, but <laughs> it, I'm not the kind of guy, it, you know, looking at me or hanging out with me, you wouldn't think that I'm going to be all fired up about just getting my butt kicked on a weekend shooting some physical stuff. But man, it was appealing. I just love, you know, the idea of getting spent, 
you know, you got three minutes on the clock and you're spent and now you're trying to do these precision rifle, pistol, shotgun shots, whatever. Um, it felt good. Yeah. So, so the Bryans have a problem that everybody wants to shoot their match. Um, the Bryans are also pretty busy. Uh, they got families, they're running local matches. So after the last one of the diehards, I, I talked to them, you know, we, we talk all the time, but so we're sitting around drinking beers and they're lamenting about so many people want to do it. And I said, well, make it a two day. And they, eh, you know, no, nah, I don't know. Not really. Maybe not. Maybe we could. And I said, well, I'll do it. You know, I'll be glad to do it. I've got some experience. You know, I, I'm running this event at my house for airplanes. I know how to do it. Um, I know what I like in matches. So, you know, all of us at shooters are at that point, right? If I was doing this, I'd do that different. And I do. We all have our idea. Oh, yeah, perfect, absolutely. Right. So I'm a man of action. And I have my idea for the perfect match. So I told the Bryans, hey, I'll make this a two-day event. I'll be glad to do it. And they said, doesn't hurt our feelings. Yeah, that'd be great because we'd like to shoot it if you did it. So then I talked to Nick and Nate Noble and you know pitched them the idea. And they thought, fantastic. Anybody that brings any shooting event to Rock Castle, they're like, fantastic. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. So you know, I'm, I'm green-lighted. I'm green-lighted from the... Uh, range owners and green lighted from the two guys that uh, did it before. So that was how it all started. Um, and, you know, with my experience before, I decided right away that it wasn't just going to be called a three gun match, it was going to be called an event. So that's what I call it the Rock Hard Three Gun Event. Nice. And the same, the same thing that I've done um, with the, the flying sports is I'm engaging people. So I, the first thing that I did is I, I made myself some rules. You know, I want this to be a long-term event. So I want some guidelines for myself before any design work starts, before anything else starts, some rules for myself. And one is to make it an event, to engage people. So, you know, to that end, how do I engage people? What, you know, how does that exactly work? And what else makes it an event? So, you know, th those things are, first off, one of my first rules was the stage is standalone. And by that, I mean, and, you know, I've done this uh, in the past when I go shoot major matches. For me, as a middle-of-the-road shooter, right, so I'm not in a prize table, um, there's nothing else for me at a match but the stages and the camaraderie of other people. Right. Um, but the stages are it for me. So I'd look at a match fee and divide by the number of stages and ask myself, would I pay – Forty dollars to shoot that stage again. Oh, that you know that's a good question. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's how I, I've talked myself out to out of uh, employment on a, a couple jobs. It's like you figure out what the uh, you know dollar per hour uh, rate is, and then would you do this if I handed you X amount of dollars right now? And then if that answer is no, you got to move on. Yeah. It, well, you know, the answer, if you look back at, at your matches, mm -hmm. it's really a great way to evaluate a match and to decide if you want to go back or not. I like that. Of course, there's more things involved in a match. But if we look at it, just the stages. So everything's removed, just the stages. Would I pay $35 to shoot that stage? So in, in every match that I've attended, 50% of the stages, I would say, Absolutely. I'll dig in my pocket. I'll hand someone $35. I'll load my guns and I'll shoot that stage again. Either because it was a, a blast to do well, probably just because it was so fun to do it. Right. Or mm -hmm. it was very challenging. Yeah. So, so that's one of my rules. One of my design rules is my stages have to stand alone. And so everything else after that is gravy. And then we go into looking at the gravy of the stuff. If we remove the stages, could I entertain these people for weekend? for that much money. What has to come from that much money? So I look at it from two angles. Um, at the Rock Hard, the, all your food is paid for. So you arrive at the lodge and all food's included in the match. It, so part of that is motivated from, I absolutely love Rock Castle Shooting Center. Mm -hmm. So I think my job as a match director is to ensure that they make enough money to be there for me for, for me to shoot forever. So that's kind of self-serving and, and it's a, um, that's okay though. Right. Cause that's the way I think. And there's one of the things, so, you know, I think, man, and I've always been that way. I go to rock castle. 
I park, I park my car on the lot and I, I eat their food and I sleep in their beds. There is, there are better hotels within driving distance for sure. There are better restaurants within driving distance, but every single dime that I spend at rock castle goes towards that shooting facility. Yeah. I love that concept. It goes for me to have a place. So, you know, and I see this the other match. I don't, I don't give people crap. Everybody can make their own decisions, but my close friends, I do give them crap. Like, Hey, let's go eat somewhere else. And I say, you guys can, but here's the deal. The, the money you spend out there does not go towards shooting. The money you spend here only goes towards shooting. So, so I use that when I did the match, you know, my first meeting with Nick and Nate is, Hey, I want to do this match here. And here's the deal. I want to include food. I don't want a deal from you. You know, I don't want a price break on the food because I'm going to get you 135 meals times four. I want you to charge what someone would charge that just walked in the door. I'm fine with that. They need to make the money. So that's, that's one of the things that happens at the rock hard. You paid for it, you know, when you bought the match fee, um, but your meals are included. We've got dinners in the evenings. We've got breakfast buffet with mounds and mounds of bacon. We've got lunches delivered to you on the stages. Oh, sweet. Yeah, the other thing about including lunches is now there's no lunch break. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got to say, like, uh, I've been to a lot of matches where uh, I'll be there, you know, shooting a stage where I see, like, the uh, lunch delivery for the ROs. And yeah. at and it, it's like you were saying, like, would I pay $35 to shoot that stage? Like, at that time, I would pay whatever the price is, eight, 12 bucks for a sandwich and some chips, you know, cause it's, it's, it's always the, uh, um, the last stage where I'm like, ah, oh, I'm freaking hungry. I gotta get my mind together for this. So that, that's pretty cool. You know, it's funny. The, the mentors that brought me into USPSA shooting, of course they're old guys. Um, so I got the old guy perspective on everything. And one of the rule number three was probably bring something to eat. And, you know, it, it makes a big difference. I see people all, you, I've brought a lot of other people into shooting as well and, and into USPSA and you, you know, you're shooting a match until three o'clock in the afternoon and your buddy didn't bring anything. He's got no, nothing to nibble on, nothing to get his energy back. And, um, it, it makes a big difference it, up until lunchtime. It doesn't make any difference, but after lunch, the guy that brought snacks is going to whip your ass. Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, I guess it does help some shooters cause it can be overwhelming. Um, give them a lunch that's delivered. Yeah. So, so, uh, out of curiosity, what is the, uh, the match fee for the rock hard? The match fee was $200, six stages. Oh, okay. And it includes lunch. Sweet. That includes it. Well, it includes a shirt and it includes, um, it includes your two lunches, um, two breakfasts and two dinners. Nice. One dinner. Anyway, yeah, we're, no, it's two dinners. We're covered for all meals. So, so when you arrive, you get fed. I like it. Yeah. Uh, and so then the other thing is, okay, so I've got that covered. What am I going to do with shooters when we're done shooting? Do I let them just wander off and do what they want to do or do I engage them? And I engage them. So I want to engage people all the way until sunset. And I do that with side matches. Um, it, it, and it's really fun because my side matches turn out, I call it the rock hard uh, king matches. So I've got a rock hard pistol king, rock hard rifle king, rock hard shotgun king, and rock hard PCC king. Nice. So all these, the rifle king matches on Friday night before the match ever starts. It's like the big icebreaker, right? Everybody gets together. We shoot this rifle side match. And um, it's, <laughs> I don't know, it seems like somebody told the story on your show before, but. The, um, the rifle King side match last year comes down to two people. And one of them is a junior that's wearing skinny jeans and red tennis shoes. <laughs> so, and the other is a, a veteran shooter that a whole lot of people know. Uh, I won't mention his name, but it's Brett Anderson. So, <laughs> so we're down to the last one, the, the rifle King side match is fun. So you come up to the line, you insert your magazine on your rifle, you charge around, you pull your magazine out. You got one round in the gun. So we all start. You got to pay to get in. So the other thing about the, the match is I wanted it to be more than just a match. This is a Mission 22 charity match. So 100% of the funds generated go to Mission 22. Uh, as everyone knows, match directors are just rich beyond means because of the money they make from being a match director. Um, 
my match director fee is also goes into mission 22. So hundred percent of the proceeds. Well, so I've got the side matches that I ask, I tell everybody you can shoot for free. I don't have a problem. It's a side match. You're welcome to do it, but I would like for you to make a donation to mission 22. So we got a can out there. Everybody throws their money in. Well, I, I got a, a part time on my um, shot clock for four seconds and I have a flasher at 50 yards. So you walk up to the line, you make ready, you insert your mag, charge your, your rifle, pull your mag out. You got one, one round in the gun. You're at low ready. At the beep, you got four seconds. Everybody that hits moves back another 50 yards. And we <laughs> keep on going back until we get down to the last two. Dude, this is like a, a game of horse that you would play with your buddies uh, at the range. Exactly. And what fun is, too, because everybody's there. Yeah. So everybody's there, right? You get The funny thing is, is four seconds is a really long time. It is. Most people would break their shot, and then two seconds later, the, the par beep would go off. It's just like everybody was hurrying their shots. I was amazed more than half the people missed that first 10-inch plate at 50 yards. Oh, wow. Yeah. So – I had a, a buy back in on the very first one. If you missed the first one, you could buy back in. Whatever you paid to shoot the side, you could pay it again to, to keep going. So we go back another 50 yards and then another 50. We only got to 150 yards and we're down to two people. <laughs> no way. Yeah. It's that four seconds, man. It's just amazing that that four seconds is that much of a crunch. You add time well, pressure that, to anything, you know. You, you've only got one round in the gun. So there's a lot of pressure. It's all internal pressure, but there's a lot of pressure. So it's a guy with iron sights, the, the veteran shooter that I won't name his name, Brett Anderson, and uh, skinny jeans. So we got an iron sight guy, we got skinny jeans, and um, Brett pulls, up, pulls his gun out there. This one I'm going to a kneeled position. So I had a, a, maybe a hay bale or some kind of barricade or something. So at the beep, you got to kneel, you got to break your shot. Um, Veteran shooter misses it. Skinny jeans pops it. Nice. And he gets the rifle king, the rock hard rifle king patch. I, I had a custom patch made in the shape of a crown that says rock hard rifle king. Boom! What a great prize and what a great game because everyone was around. It was big fun. It sounds like a good time. Like just again something that you would uh, be doing on a, a Friday night anyway. Right. Yeah. So Saturday, you know, we shoot our stages. We shoot three stages a day. Um, and when we're done, then we do all the, the pistol King shotgun King PCC King. The cool thing about those side matches is it's other people's ammo. So I have, um, ammo sponsors that donate the rounds. Uh, Gamel's just agreed to give me 1500 shotgun rounds. So the shotgun King side match, you get to shoot somebody else's shot shells. That's even better. It is. And, <laughs> and uh, Grayson, Grayson says that if your gun won't run the brand that they brought, then you probably ought to buy a gun. <laughs> and they sell them. He didn't say that, but he probably thinks that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I have a, one of my stages I call the Pistol Bay Rumble. And if you've ever been to Rock Castle, you know the Pistol Bays. There's four, well, there's five bays. The last bay is a, is a long bay. Well, this one stage uses all five bays. So you start at the end, and you have to run over berms and around berms nice. and into berms and back and use all three guns and shoot a, a grueling three. It was a five-minute part time. My goal is that my winner shoots it in three. That's so, uh, it's reminiscent of what we did uh, last year at Hard as Hell, right? There was several climbing berm stages. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm not afraid to say it, but Ken and his crew out there in Utah have inspired me to do a lot of things. So those guys have been at it longer than I have. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll reinvent the wheel. You know, I'll do things differently. But then there are some things that are just good. And, you know, like I said, I'm not afraid to admit it, that they've inspired me to, to use a lot of the, the styles and the techniques that they use out there. They do. They run a good match. Yeah, you know, when... Uh when we, I want to say that we, we had met like once before, but when we were chatting out at uh, hard as hell, you were like, Hey, I got this, uh, this match coming up and it's uh March in Kentucky. And, and I was like, dude, I'm not going to Kentucky in March. Like <laughs> be wet, cold, snowy mess. No, thank you. And, uh, what was the, uh, what was the weather like, Bruce? It was like 60, 65 and sunny. Oh. Yeah. It turned out just to be a, look, 
the the buildup. So I'm at Rock Castle for the entire week prior building mm-hmm. the stages. Yeah, because these are these are elaborate stages. It's not like you just go hang some shit from trees and and uh, shoot at them. Like it's pretty involved, right? It, it really is. You know, um, so like I get. I, I work on my stages just about every evening. You know, I get home from work and I have a beer and I pull out my stage illustrations and I tweak my stages. So I think that it's, you know, I don't have a lot going on as far as match design. And you get that when you come to one of my matches, you can see the time, the hours that I have in each stage because I really do spend a lot of time working them out. Um, You know, I bounce ideas off my shooting buddies. I show them my illustrations and it becomes – course i make the decisions right so i'm not going to do what they say but every now and then you get a nice little (laughs) nugget from somebody and you know this year christine has played a big role she's really put some stages together for me you know we come out to the barn and pop an adult beverage and just doodle around on stages um so you know I've, i've got hours and hours and hours in each of the stages i really really think i'm through but then i'm also open when I, when I go to put them on the ground, um, I'm really quick to look for natural terrain advantages. So I'll completely change the stage if I can get over here and use this hump or, or this tree or something like that. So I'm not opposed to some last minute changes, but yeah, right now I've got six stages that when I look at them, I smile and I giggle um, Nice, because they're awesome because I know that my best shooter is going to take three minutes. And that's a long time on the clock. It's a long time on the clock for sure. So it's it's funny. I looked at last year, the winner of my match was on the clock for 17 minutes in six stages. That's a and long I time. Looked, like I, I would, uh, man, I don't know what other match you could do that at. Well, I looked at the Blue Ridge scores and I looked at Hard as Hell scores. So Blue Ridge is a nine round, a nine stage match. Hard as hell is a, a nine or ten. I know it was ten this year. It may have been ten last year, but it's a nine. Let's say it's a nine stage match. Mm-hmm. They also finished in seventeen minutes. Oh, okay. It was really funny to. It was like, oh, so seventeen minutes is the magic number because that's where all these matches come in. Yeah, but you have three so, less stages. Three less stages, and it's the same time frame. Um, so yeah, they're hard. Uh, you know, I don't make any apologies for that. It's called the rock hard. And I'm going at it to be hard. The, you know, the other thing, there's this, this selfish self-motivation, right? I would love it that people come to shoot my match, mm-hmm. really design the match for me. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 uh, it's scratching your own itch, right? You at least have a, uh, a customer base of one because you know that you'd want to shoot it. And there's probably a few more dudes out, out there like you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's quite satisfying. It's just like, you know, my airplane event. It's for me. This is the kind of thing that I want to do. It's awesome that everybody in the country wants to do it too. And, you know, last year was the first year of the rock hard and the response was overwhelming. You know, they, they really, really loved it. And it, it does make me happy that there are like-minded people out there that want to do exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. I saw the, uh, the footage from last year, uh, sunny, beautiful day, climbing up and down things, running with things. And I was like, well, I, I definitely messed up on this one. I think I even sent you a, a message like, yep, I was wrong. Sorry. Yeah, I think I remember. It. it was a pretty quick one, too. It was like the Tuesday after, like, dude, I can't yeah. believe that I've waved that off. I effed up. My bad. <laughs> yeah. But that's all right. My response was probably it was sewed out, so I didn't care. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, that that's a problem. Being that it's short days, I have to I have to really be conscious of getting the match done and trying to figure out how many people I can run through this thing and actually get it done with short days. So right. I hate it. You know, I'm limited to 135 shooters, which is up. Last year I was 96 shooters. Wow. So I, I did find some space um, at, at, the, at my own time expense. Um, I'm shooting – I moved the ROs to shoot the day before, which – and I, div, I, I made a division called Hard Ass. So you can shoot – I was apprehensive to do this too, um, but you can shoot the match in one day. You can shoot the hard ass division. Uh huh. I'm thinking I got my ROs on all on Friday, and it would be a lot easier on them reset wise if they had other shooters with them. So I was able to open up another 18 spots just for people that wanted to shoot hard ass. I wasn't really sure if anybody would choose to do that, but the hard ass division is full. 
Really? So what 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 is the uh, hard ass division? It's their responsibility to help the uh, ROs reset on Friday or on yeah Friday. Uh, they shoot all six stages on Friday with the with ROs. The oh, yeah. okay, cool. Right. Yeah. So and you know I I, I try to communicate really well uh, with the shooters. Uh, my last email communication with all the registered shooters was that you're welcome to do walkthroughs on Friday if the stage is empty. I got four squads shooting six stages. I invited all the people doing walkthroughs to volunteer for reset. So I think that's a good compromise. Um, you know, if you, if you really want to see a stage, what better way to see it than to, you know, walk through and do all the reset while it's going on as opposed to just kicking people off the stage because someone else has it. Yeah. The one thing that I would say though, is that, uh, there is the air quotes. I'm doing a walkthrough. Uh, walk through slash resetting and then there's the uh i'm actually helping reset yeah, so no air, uh, no air gun in my reset yeah exactly like i i've been you know i've shot a lot of ro matches this uh this season and uh there was so many times where you see a guy like go tape two holes and then start air gunning it's like bro if you're gonna do that get out of here go to the next yeah. stage like this is our match and uh and you'll have your time in in like 20 minutes when we're done here well, you know, I, I have a, a unique stage design um, because they're so long. So I only have reset in the first half of the stage. My goal, and this was, you know, back to my original set of the, the goals to do a match, is to be able to say, unload, show, clear, are you ready, stand by. That's my goal on every single stage. So I've got a second RO. His job is to deliver a ready shooter. Nice. With all the reset on the first half, the reset is completely done before the shooter's even done shooting. Um, so it, it does make things flow very quickly. Again, this short time of year, I have to be crazy conscious about the time that it takes to actually run the shooters. You know, last year I did the math. It was funny because I emailed the shooters about three times. I brought it up at the shooters meeting, and then I emailed them immediately after that, and then I emailed them again. So if you do the math, if every single shooter wastes 30 seconds, so 30 seconds is not a long time. Like, oh, hey, Dave, you're up. Oh, shit, where's my magazine? Let me get this. You meander up to the start line. Yep. 30 seconds is not a long time. Every shooter wastes 30 seconds. That's six hours. That's crazy. That's a ridiculous amount of time. So the motivation to get these people um, responsible for this time frame is I have got – Four stages of free ammo. I've got 5,000 rounds of bullets that need to be shot, and the only way we can shoot those is if the sun is up. So if you waste time out there dicking around, wasting 30 seconds, then nobody gets to shoot other people's ammo, and nobody gets <laughs> to be crowned the rock-hard pistol king. So it's good motivation. You know, it's... It's one of those things I find if you ask people to do things, explain the consequences of not doing those things, they'll do them. Right. You know, that goes back. My shooter's meeting is, is the shooter's responsibilities. I think that everybody should be reminded of the shooter's responsibilities. As a match director, I can spend six months going over every little detail of a match. Once that first shot goes off, it's out of my hands. There's nothing that I can, that I can do to expedite that match. It's absolutely up to the shooters and the shooters need to look at it as a whole. You know, it, it's like, Hey guys, you can't, I know this is a place where you're thinking about yourself. It's all about you. You want to perform, but you need to think about 134 other people and all those 134 other people, they want to get it done too. So, you know, you take the time and you explain that to the shooters, what their responsibility is they're in charge of things going smooth or not and they'll do it for you. Right. Yeah. We're all in this, all in this together. Okay. Yeah. We are all in this together. You know, another way I, I've found to expedite the match is I don't have any pistol dump barrels in the match. Yeah. That's, I've, that's unique. It, it, well, you know, when you ask a shooter to do something on the clock, they're going to do it really fast. Yep. So, but, but look at your, your typical match when you're, when you're discarding firearms along the course of fire. So unload, show clear. Oh, let's go over here and get this one. And let's go over here and get this one. And where's my other gun? So by not having a pistol dump, 
you cannot holster a hot pistol in my match. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is it's a lot safer to reholster an empty gun. Not many people practice holstering a hot gun and, and to have the pressure to do that on the clock, that's a bad idea. Um, so I don't want people to have to holster a hot gun on the clock. And then that there's another thing is if that gun falls out of their holster and it's loaded, you know what happens. Go home. I've been there. You, you go home. And so, so I've shot plenty of matches and I thought, why the hell is my gun hot? Why is my pistol hot right now? It shouldn't be hot right now. It would be a lot better if it wasn't hot because if I dropped it, I could pick it up. So there's the other motivation for not having a pistol dump. It expedites the match. When they're finished, their gun's on them. It's clear. Um, and drop it, kick it, throw it. I don't care what you do with it because we all know that it's empty. And so the, uh, there's a couple other rules that you, uh, that you got rid of um, that you know we would see in, in uh, ordinary matches. What uh, what what are those uh, rules that you got rid of that you considered? Eh, those aren't for me. <laughs> well, you know it's funny. I hate safety rules that aren't really safety rules. Mm-hmm. We can call it a procedural. I'd be fine if you call abandoning an, a firearm without the safety engage a procedural. I'm on board. You wrote that rule. I'm fine with it. You give me a 10 second procedural. But when you call that a safety violation and you want to disqualify me or someone else, I'm throwing out the BS flag. Um, I feel like it is the match director's job to design a safe receptacle to put a gun in, in any condition. We can't put some, we can't allow the shooter to do something and act like they're not going to do what we want them to or act like nobody's going to do something unsafe. Um, so, you know, I, I try to, to, again, prevent that. I design a safe receptacle and everybody does that. Now you don't see any loose dump barrels anymore. Um, used to be pretty common or you'd see something with a bouncy bottom, but so, you know, I've got the right receptacle. It's bolted down. It's not going anywhere. If your gun goes off in that receptacle, it's a safe place for you to discharge that firearm. So it's not a safety issue if your safety is not engaged. No penalty, no nothing. I do encourage people to, to give you some crap about it. If you dump a gun and it wasn't on safe, I prefer – and the rules state this. I prefer it to be safe, but it's not a requirement, and I would hope your squad mates give you crap about it. So that, you know, that's one of the rules that I, that I got rid of. Um, another rule that I thought was, again, a safety rule. It's not a safety rule. It's kind of dumb is that you can't touch two firearms at the same time. Or, you know, they, they relax it a bit and say that you can't fire a firearm while you're touching another firearm. And again, I think, well, we can safely do that. Why not do that? To the point of last year, I started a stage with a shotgun, um, Virginia count. Another thing that I get from USPSA. Virginia counts means you can only shoot X amount of rounds. Mm -hmm. at the it's a penalty if you shoot more. So I take that one step further. We start a shotgun array with nine plates. You've got nine in the gun. You're not allowed to reload at that point. So start position, boom, go, 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 blast your nine plates out, and then you immediately go to pistol. There's no dump bucket. So it's a pistol run through the woods, through paper targets, and there's no place to put your shotgun. So I forced the shooters to carry an empty shotgun while they shot pistol. See, I, I think that's kind of cool. Like, you know, it's in a safe condition. There, there's no ammunition in it, you know, and right. there's a lot of times where we'll force people to carry something so they have to shoot, you know, stronger weak hand. You know, they'll yeah. have to do some one-handed shooting. Why not the shotgun? <laughs> right. So, you know, that was just kind of me thumbing my nose at that rule saying, okay, I think it's a dumb rule, so I'm going to force people to do it. Well, that stage worked out really good because then I got the problem is um, after we shoot the pistol, you can't holster a hot pistol. But I need you to transition to your shotgun. So I came up with the idea of I called them high value targets. So you're up in the woods. You just shot your nine shotgun shots and you run through there and you blast these papers that are close and you get to this log. And I've got one piece of steel a 10 inch plate at about, I don't know, 30 yards, not a real hard plate, but you have to drop your pistol mag and then shoot the plate. Nice. I like and that. that. And that was a 20 second 
penalty. It was a high value target. So, you know, there's this pressure that, that I kind of force people to put on themselves. It's a strong hand only shot. It doesn't have to be, you can throw your empty shotgun on the ground. Matter of fact, a lot of people did. Um, but you've only got one, one bullet to shoot this plate. And, 50% 50% of my competitors missed that target. It was an easy, I mean, a 10 inch <laughs> plate at 30 yards. We should be able to hit that all day. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it's like the, uh, it's like the rifle target we were talking about earlier. Once you put stakes or constraints on something, it becomes more, more important. And, uh, our, our heads pay more attention to it and maybe too much attention to it and cause us to screw up. Yeah. I love working those internal pressures. Any chance that I get, um, so yeah, that was fun. I, you know, I actually did that in a couple other spots where you had to drop the mag and take the one shot. That reminds me, I just made a note. I don't have any of those in the match this year. I need to work that in. That was a fun target. Um, so another rule that I thought is, is just as dumb as it can be. Once you abandon a firearm, it's dead. Yeah. You can't use it. So, so this goes back to um, my match design rules. This is a, a rule that I refer back to. Um, actually I know them pretty well, so I don't have to refer back to, but I remember them. So one of the, the, the uniqueness or the flavor of my match is I want you to use your guns more than once. So it's not your standard three gun match where you just roll through succession, pistol, rifle, shotgun, shotgun, rifle, pistol, however you do it, but you shoot one, get rid of it, shoot another one, get rid of it, finish with one. I don't do that in any stages. So somehow I make you come back to a gun either, you know, if it's rifle, I had a stage last year, you had to sling the rifle two times. So you shoot it, you sling it, you shoot something else, you shoot the rifle, you sling it, you shoot something else, you shoot the rifle. Um, you know, that, one, that actually was a really tough stage because unloading, slinging, um, unslinging it, that binds people up. You know, the good guys, it doesn't bother the, the guys that are in it to win it. They can sling a rifle and unsling a rifle just as fast as they can load a pistol. Mm -hmm. But the people that didn't practice it, that was tough. Um, You know, and I do it with with the pistol. It's easy. You unload the pistol, you holster it, you shoot a bunch of stuff, and you get your pistol back out. Um, But there are other times where I'll do it with shotguns. So, you know, I'll I'll force you to shoot a shotgun array, dump your shotgun in a barrel, run off, shoot a bunch of other stuff, and come back, pull that shotgun out of the barrel, load it back up, and get back on it. Um, you know, that's just one of the flavors that I like of my match. I love doing that. And, and I do it in every stage. You're going to use a gun, at least one of them. You're going to use it twice. Very cool. Well, so the, uh, the rock hard has a ton of thought put into it. It's a six stage match and, uh, you get time on the clock from, from nine stages, which is uh, excellent value for the money, by the way. When uh, when you went out to um, Hard as Hell this year, there's there's a little behind the scenes meeting, and it sounds like there's uh, some collaboration going on uh, across the U.S. for matches like Rock Hard that are more physical, more difficult, lot of lot of shooting, a lot of time spent on the clock. Yeah, it, really exciting. So this is my my um, third year going out to Hard as Hell in Utah, um, and so after. I probably shouldn't tell everybody this, but um, after the match, I call it the after party. So, you know, Christine always goes out with me and she's a trooper. She loves hanging out and seeing everything shoot. Well, last year I decided, actually she decided we didn't want to ship ammo back. We were just going to go out in the desert. Everybody there says, oh yeah, just pull off the road anywhere and shoot, you know, shoot your ammo. I'm like, well, that's kind of lame, but (laughs) we were spending vacation there for a while. Also sounds Uh, like a trap. It does sound like a trap. Exactly right. It sounds like a trap. (laughs) I'm not a sucker. What are they doing to me? Because just because I'm from Kentucky, they're going to try to get me into this federal trap. <laughs> so anyway, we're it's Monday morning after the match. We're getting ready to roll. And Christine says, hey, can't we just go back to the range and shoot there? And I thought, well, probably. I shoot Ken Nelson a text and tell him, you know, what we want to do. And his, his response is, gates unlocked. Be safe. Have fun. So that was the first hard as hell after party. You can actually go to um, – YouTube and look for hard as hell after party. Cause I put together a nice video. So Christine <laughs> nice. gets to with no one there. Right. So they, they put as much energy into their match as anyone. All their staff is there for weeks ahead of time and, and just working their butts off, working their butts off for the match. So nobody is there on Monday. 
So we go. Christine gets to shoot all the ammo she wants. She gets to try every prop, shoot out of the trenches, and shoot all this other stuff. So that's the plan. We do that again this year. Well, I talked because Brian Nelson's the match director. I asked him, and he's like, yeah, sure, be safe, have fun. So we're out there blasting away ammo. She's you know up on a tower shooting at the 470-yard target, which she hit on three power, by the way. So like I'm looking up. She's on the tower, and she's dialing the scope back, and I'm thinking, Pfft. What is she doing? And then she starts blasting this 470 yard target, which, so I hit it on the clock and I was just as happy as I could be. And then she gets up there and pops it on three power. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? So anyway, we're, we're out there shooting and Brian Nelson comes out and says, Hey, let's go to lunch. And I was like, well, we got some ammo to shoot. Let's go to lunch later. So we have a lunch meeting and um, Brian says, let's do a hard as hell series. Let's make it three matches and have a points race and have a hard as hell champion, series oh, champion. Points race? So, yeah. And I mean, I'm just as excited as I can be. I'm like, oh, this is a great idea. Sure. So Sky Killian out in Texas, she's actually in Waxahachie, Texas, which is Dallas. Um, Sky's putting on hard as hell Texas, and that's going to be in September, September 21st. Um, so she's the second stop in the hard as hell series. Um, the rock hard is the first stop. And then, um, like I said, Sky's putting on that match out at the, um, extreme tactics and training solutions range, which is the range that I, I'm pretty sure she runs with her husband. I could be way wrong on that. Um, but anyway, <laughs> they, they run matches. It's a great facility out there. Have you been there? Uh, so no, I haven't been to that one. Uh, she, she actually runs the three gun match out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So she's got some experience. She's a hard as hell shooter. She's been out there for a couple of years. So she's got, you know, great experience in shooting that match. She mm -hmm. loves shooting the hard stuff. Uh, Brian's working with her this year to, um, you know, make sure that she has the flavor of the match. I'm working with her. So we've, ever since the meeting, we've been exchanging emails and, uh, really some, some great ideas and some great plans um, and it's just exciting as it can be, uh, Louisville to Dallas is where you go when you fly, no matter where you're going to end up. <laughs> so oh, nice. I, I can do a straight flight in there in September and, you know, she's going to, going to put on the same style of match. So anybody that's, that's excited about the physical stuff, the high round count, um, just getting spent on the clock, we've got three venues to do it and somebody is going to be the hard as hell series champion. Yeah, you know, and it, it's cool that you guys, uh, um, you know, not only created this series, but um, the people involved are great. Like, you're super enthusiastic. I know that Sky is super enthusiastic about uh, shooting and competing in competition as well. Obviously, the Nelsons are. It's their, uh, you know, their their uh, their live their life pretty much for uh, for for Brian, and uh, it, it's cool to see passionate people coming together and uh, building something more than what they could do on their own you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's exciting well so the uh so the match uh at ETTS when is that happening the match is going to be the weekend of September uh 21 22 23 okay and um she is working on opening registration on New Year's so January 1st she, you should be able to sign up for the match and um I, yeah, that's that's all that I know. I would expect her to be, you know, that time of year, longer days. She's got nicer weather yeah. out there in Texas. So I would expect that to be a nine or a ten round match. And, you know, fully hard. Plate carriers and dragging heavy stuff and climbing over things. Nice. And so that's uh, – that, if you listen uh, real time, is just uh, five days away. Registration opens for that. And uh, the hard as hell, the traditional hard as hell in uh st george utah is going to be first weekend in december like it usually is um not sure when registration is going to open up but th so those are the two matches that you can get uh this year and for uh for all of us uh you know late late comers here that aren't in uh rock hard how's the uh, point series going to work is it is it going to hurt the people that um weren't able to get into rock hard this year we haven't really gone thoroughly down that road um but i suspect that it's just going to be the points from all three so yeah if you're not in the rock hard i don't think you're going to win the series this year i gotcha right it shouldn't cut down on the fun factor no no 
and I do have a lot of people in the rock hard that um, that shoot the hard as hell. Um, you know, there's some heavy hitters that got in there, some guys that are in it to win it. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, you know, my, my match is full, um, a little bit over full, if I'm honest. But um, next year, hopefully you can get in. I tell you what I do. Um, you know, I did this my first year. And unless somebody tells me it's a really bad idea, and I probably wouldn't listen to that person anyway, I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> um, all of my pre- well, the only person that would tell me it's a really, really bad idea, are the people that haven't ever shot my match. Everybody that shot my match last year got to sign up a week before registration opened. Yeah, for the match this year. So, so, uh, so I've that experienced that one. I'm sorry, that? I've experienced that one before in uh, in other matches, and uh, been kind of a, a grump about it, a vocal grump, if you will. And uh, yeah. I was bitching. Let's let's be honest. Um, and uh, it's because yeah, I wasn't I wasn't a part of that match. But as as someone who's now returning to matches after like my first year traveling and shooting major matches, uh, I do see that as a, as a value for sure. Yeah. You know, especially something like mine, I, I'm, I'm limited to 135 shooters. So, you know, is it, is it fair to award places to the people that had the best schedule and they could be off and their computer connection was really fast? Um, I think that's less fair. So, um, you know, I like to reward again, I'm a charity match. So a hundred percent of what I do is for mission 22. I want to write a big fat check to them. Last year I wrote them a $5,000 check. Uh, this year I'd like to write them a eight or $9,000 check. So the people that came to the match, they gave me a lot of money. They didn't give me a lot of money. They gave mission 22 a lot of money. I, I don't feel bad rewarding them for that. You know, the, the match fee pays everything that's left over and i've got a ton of expenses right i mean there's there's food and there's uh i got a 50 cal this year we're all shooting a 50 caliber <laughs> to start a stage nice. big old how, how crazy is that um so you know there's ammo i gotta buy 1500 rounds well no i gotta buy 135 rounds e- either way i'm buying a bunch of ammo um so i like to reward the guys i'm gonna ask them to pay five bucks a sh- on the spot you can dry fire the gun or you can buy a round for five bucks Um, so these people show up and out of 96 people last year, I raised $5,000. That's significant. That is significant. They need to get rewarded if they like the match, if they like what I do and they want to keep supporting mission 22, then they get first dibs to get into the match. It's a, it's a reward. I like to, to, you know, work those rewards in all the way around. I like that. Well, so Bruce, what is, uh, for those not familiar, what is the, Mission 22, uh, I guess, mission? What is their um, mission? Uh, you know, I think that it, in part it's awareness that uh, 22 veterans a day commit suicide. Um, it, you know, it's a made-up number, but it's a damn close number, and it's a, it's a horrible statistic that the, if we look at demographics of suicides, veterans are just far outweigh anyone else. If you look at uh, female suicides, that's almost exclusively veterans. So, you know, it's an outreach program. It's a, it's a help program. It's everything that they can do to try to get help to these people that are on the edge, um, try to prevent this stuff and save our heroes. You know, these are people that make America. Um, it's an important thing to me. I'm a veteran. Um, I've lost veteran friends to suicide. It's a, it's a terrible thing. So I think first is awareness. You know, the, the more that we know about this, the more that we talk about this, and the more that someone in that position realizes that there's a support system out there. And then I think, secondly, you know, there's there's the help program. They do things. They, they engage veterans uh, that are coming back from some bad situations and try to get them in a place where they, they can move forward, where they've got some positive things going in their life. So, you know, uh, my impression is it, is it started as a as an awareness, and it ends up as an outreach and a help, and uh, just really saving the lives of people that are out there doing American things for American people. Um, so it's important to me, and uh, you know, it should be important to everybody. There's plenty you can learn about uh, Mission Twenty Two, Mission Twenty Two dot org. Um, you know, and those guys are all going to be there. Mission Twenty Two has a shooting team, and it's comprised of veterans that were most likely operators and they're coming back and they're shooting. Those guys are going to be at my match. They're all shooting the hard ass division. So they're shooting. 
<laughs> they're hard ass people. Yeah. Um, their shooting is done on Friday. So then I've got the mission 22 team is going to be there. They're going to be there running my side matches. They're going to be there selling raffle tickets. So, you know, I'm not a prize table match. Um, I think that at least for what I do as a charity, I don't want to spend any money on prize tables. Uh, I, I do a custom patch for the winner. I think it's a, it's just an awesome award. The people that got them last year love it. You can stick it on the, on your sleeve. You can put it on your range bag, and it's a trophy that you can just parade around for the rest of the year. So I have awards. Um, I also have prizes. Because it's a Mission 22 match, I use 22 throughout the match. Like just about every time you pick up your shotgun, you're going to have to shoot 22 targets. <laughs> every, every stage I work it in, there's 22. You know, I've got a stage that has 22 paper targets on your pistol run. So your first start with a pistol run is going to shoot 44 rounds at paper, not just static paper, stuff that moves around. I've got, I still got buddies from USPSA, and they are the king of activated moving paper targets. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, I work 22 in there all over the place throughout the stages. You'll see that as you shoot the match. You'll hear that in the stage briefs. But what's you know, it, it's kind of funny. The same. So the same thing I did with my airplane contest. I have. I have trophies for the winners, but I always get a sponsor that makes the, the best model airplane that there is. And, and these little airplanes are $1,500, $2,000. They're expensive little toys. So I've always awarded the middle of the pack. The guy that finishes exactly in the middle gets the best model airplane that money can buy. And I've found out over the years that that guy is much more appreciative. That sponsor gets more mileage out of out of the middle of the pack than anyone else. Yeah. First off, the guy really needed it, and that guy's really happy about it. And damn, he's he's a medium pilot, and he got the best prize. So it's such a good response. I've been doing that for nine years. They absolutely love it. They even try to game it. Um, difficult to do in shooting. Difficult to do <laughs> in, in flying toy airplanes. It just it's tough. So anyway, I've got some some really kick-ass sponsors, and I save the best prizes, guns, things with serial numbers on them. 22nd place overall is going to get something with a serial number on it. The winner is going to get a patch. 22nd place is going to get a kick-ass gun. I do that on stages as well. So when I bring a sponsor, a sponsor says, oh, hey, I want to sponsor a stage. Well, I say, okay, two things. I need two prizes. I need one, a lesser prize, or even, it's up to you, but I need a prize for a stage winner. Every stage winner gets something, no, that's and I cool. need a, a really cool prize for 22nd place. So 22nd place on every stage is going to walk away feeling damn good because they got something that was you know, pretty awesome. I like that. It's, uh, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be like the, uh, you know, top guys duking it out who aren't going to like that, obviously, but for, uh, for the rest of us, the um you know the the general population i guess you could say that's a pretty cool uh, thing to have you know you know there again that's that self motivated i'm a middle of the road shooter i'd love to be <laughs> yeah. you know, i'd love to to come in on a really good day like i'm middle of the road but if i have a really good day i could be up there in 22nd place hell i got 10th place on a stage a overall 10th place on a stage out in, at hard as hell this year that's like my career highlight right yeah there. buddy so yeah it's really exciting i love to do that 22nd place thing and you know that reminds me too so i have the stage that uses all the bays i call that the pistol bay rumble or pbr for short oh nice i was wondering where that that came into play yeah so the pbr so you know that stage was great last year it's five bays i could do that for 10 years straight three matches a year and it would always be different so I kept that spot. There are some iconic places at, at Rock Castle that, you know, they've got 3,000 acres. I could put something down in the woods, um, but there's some pretty iconic spots. I mean, a Pistol Bay is not iconic, but Cowboy Town and the Bath House, those are really unique places. Anyway, back to the Pistol Bay Rumble. So secretly, um, as I'm setting up, I, I was talking to uh, Nick and Nate, and I said, hey, I need a six-pack of Paps Blue Ribbon a six pack of PBR and that's going to be the stage prize. So whoever wins this stage is getting the ice down six pack of PBR. Awesome idea. Really, really cool. Until 
a junior wins the stage. <laughs> <laughs> now what? Oh, it was, it was actually, we, I had a lot of fun with it. You know, I, it, if you come to the match, plan to stay for the awards, plan to, to be there for the shooters meeting. Cause I have a lot of fun with it. Um, in any way, in this case, um, you know, I talk it up and stage winners. Well, I had them in a brown paper bag, so nobody knows what I've got in my hand, right? So, you know, congratulations, I give 22nd place for that stage. I think, I forget what it was. Um, so anyway, I was like, all right, first place. And I, you know, I reach into the bag and zip the, the, the bag off. And there it is, a six pack of PBR tall boys. Actually, I think it's a four pack. Don't they come in fours? Who drinks that stuff anyway? I think they come in six because... It's well, cheap. they were the tall boys. They were the one pounder. Yeah, I don't. Do they come in other sizes? I, I, I don't. So anyway, I whipped that out and I'm like, "Hey, Jake took Oscar." So you know, here comes this seventeen-year-old junior <laughs> running up, all big smile, you know, just ear to ear smile, and he outstretches his hands. And about a half inch before he touched the beers, I jerked him away from him <laughs> and called his dad up there. And, uh, well, you know, there was some videos going on. I didn't want to be contributing to the delinquency. Of course. Um, so anyway, his, his dad came up and I let his dad take the beers from me and, uh, it was a good fun time. And I, I think it, it, you know, it probably worked out really good from the, the father son standpoint. Cause dad got the share when they got home, he told me they iced them down and, you know, they sat down and had a beer. But as a dad, it was probably the best choice because his first taste of beer was a just a skunky, nasty beer. So <laughs> Perhaps that probably kept him on the straight and narrow, uninterested in beer at that point. <laughs> yeah, if that's what beer tastes like, then you don't want any of it. You're right. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bruce, uh, man, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I've got some. I've got some really good sponsors this year, so you know I'm gonna be able to pull off the um, the first and the twenty second on stages and. You know, cats out of the bag. The winner of the Pistol Bay Rumble is getting some tall boy PBRs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if it's an adult, I'll expect him to do the PBR challenge right there and shotgun one. Oh, nice. That'd be great. So I'm putting this out there. Whoever <laughs> wins the PBR stage, you better cannonball that beer right in front of everybody. <laughs> the gauntlet <laughs> has been thrown down. I love it. <laughs> I'd love to see it. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bruce, yeah. you know, I, go ahead. Like I said, man, I I love your uh, I love your enthusiasm. I think the uh, you know the um, supporting a charity is a great thing. You're doing uh you're doing cool stuff in in conjunction with the uh, the Rockcastle Shooting Center, ETTS, SUPS, all kinds of great people involved in the series that you're doing, and of of course your match. So, man, I I, I wish you uh, wish you well. I hope you guys have a great match and a lot of fun, and I appreciate you being here on the three gun show and uh telling us all about it oh it was my pleasure dave good spending the afternoon with you hey before you take off check out the show notes at three gunshow.com for links to things that bruce and i discussed in this podcast you can also sign up on patreon as a three gun show supporter or purchase your very own born to three gun show t-shirt as always this podcast is brought to you by armalite armalite has allowed me to get special pricing for listeners on their line of three gun rifles both the 13 and a half and the 18 inch as well as their competition handguards, gas blocks, and tunable muzzle brakes. If you're in the market for a rifle or component to build your own, email me, dave at 3 gunshowcom and I will hook you up. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and subscribing to the show. I'm Dave Hartman for Bruce Davidson, and we'll see you on the range. Unload show clear.